。現在舉行立法會例行。The regular council meeting now commences. Questions. Question one: The Honourable Jimmy Ng. Thank you, President. As the corona disease, coronavirus disease 29th epidemic has dealt a heavy blow to the economy of Hong Kong, the government has launched one after another two trenches of the Employment Support Scheme or ESS to provide financial support for eligible employers to assist them in paying employees' wages from June to August and from September to November last year, respectively, thereby retaining those employees who may otherwise be made redundant. Regarding the government's support for those employers and employees affected by the epidemic, will the government inform this council, one, as some employers have relayed that the application procedure and the vetting and approval procedure of the second trench of ESS were obviously more complicated and lengthy than those of the first trench, resulting in their not receiving the wage subsidies under the second trench of ESS for a prolonged period of time. Of the reasons for that, two, of the respective numbers of complaints and reports of abuse received about ESS so far, together with the breakdown by the type of issues involved, as well as the follow-up actions taken and the outcomes, and three, as the government has made it clear that it will not launch a third trench of ESS, but the epidemic has not subsided, and some members of the public are worried about the onset of waves of enterprises closing down unemployment, whether the government has plans to set up a loan fund for occupations reaching for the unemployed. So as to support unemployed persons for self-enhancement and occupation switching, if so, of the detail of not the reasons for that. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. President, in consultation with uh, relevant bureaus and departments, my consolidated reply to the member's question is as follows. One, the objective of the ESS is to preserve employment during the pandemic by providing time-limited financial assistance to employers to retain employees who may otherwise be made redundant. We've endeavoured to streamline and simplify the administrative arrangements in designing the scheme with a view to dispersing wage subsidies as soon as practicable so as to assess as many businesses and employees as possible within a short period of time. The ESS Secretariat has been processing all applications in an expeditious manner. Actual figures have indeed reflected that most employees receive wage subsidies within a short period of time. Within three weeks upon closure of the first trench, of ESS, the Secretary has dispersed wage subsidies to about 110,000 employers, accounting for 70% of the total number of employers who have successfully applied for the first trench. Leveraging on the experience of the first trench, the Secretary has been more efficient in processing applications in the second trench. Within three weeks upon closure of applications for the second trench, the Secretary has dispersed wage subsidies of 125,000 employers. About 8% of the total number of employees who are successful, way above the 70% disbursement rate in the first trench. As regards the remaining 20% of employee application in the second trench, they require longer processing time because uh, they involve cases reduction in second trench wage subsidies due to compliance with the terms and conditions under the first trench. Employees have been participating in other retirement plan outside the context of mandatory provenance scheme or omission of information relating to the application. Second, as at 9 of March 2021, the Secretary has received a total of 1,105 complaints, 41% of which involves unreasonable reduction in the number of employees or redundancy, 16% of which requests employees to take continuous no pay leave, 10% of which did not promptly disperse wage to employees or reduction in wages and 2% of suspected cases of winding down of the company or change of business operators. The Secretary and the processing agent will proactively and seriously follow up all reported cases. The Policy Innovation and Coordination Office, responsible for implementing ESS, established a review panel to review the investigation report and relevant MPF scheme records of employees for each reported case. With a view to determining if the employers concerned have complied with the relevant terms and conditions under the scheme, as well as informing the complainants of the results upon conclusion of investigation. As of 1,105 reported cases, the Secretariat has, as at 9th of March, completed an investigation of 1,069 cases and replied to the complainants. 
Of the 1,069 cases with investigations concluded, the sector has thus far confirmed that 608 employers did not comply with the terms of the ESS. The Secretariat will, in accordance with the terms and conditions of the ESS, request relevant employers return to the government the unspent balance of waste subsidies and or pay a penalty to the government in respect of the failure to maintain the committed headcount of paid employees. Moreover, the, employ the Secretariat has referred 274 cases to the Labor Department under the Employment Ordinance because they involve labor disputes and are referred to to the Customs and Excise Department as well as one report or complaint to the Immigration Department and the Inner Revenue Department respectively. In addition, the Secretariat has referred 23 complaints to the MPF Authority concerning MPF contributions made by employers. Three, in view of uh, the fluctuations of the epidemic, uh, which has serious affect Hong Kong's economy and our labor market, the government has uh, kept in view changes of the actual circumstances and tried to employ ways to strengthen assistance for the unemployed and their families. In light of the stiff challenges uh, brought about by the epidemic to Hong Kong's employment situation over the economy in the past year, the government has implemented a host of measures to create and stabilize job opportunities and also provided relief measures to sectors and individuals hardly by the epidemic or affected by the anti-epidemic and social distancing measures. The um, through the uh, anti-epidemic fund and budget, the government has increased government expenditure substantially to combat the epidemic and roll out relief measures totaling about $300 billion. It is anticipated that the consolidated deficit for the financial year 2020-2021 will surge to about $250 billion. The government will have in regard to the development of the epidemic and the situation of different sectors, review the effectiveness of our measures and introduce enhancements if needed. Uh, the job market is gloomy and the tremendous challenges to Hong Kong's economic situation and overall economy um, uh, has caused the government to implement various measures to promote job creation, employment, and employment, and to support individuals' families' financial difficulties. The relevant measures include the provision of 2,000 employment places under the GBA Youth Employment Scheme, the third tranche of the Love Upgrading Special Scheme launched by the Employees Retraining Board in January this year. Uh, uh, with a double quota for 20,000 trainees, followed by the fourth tranche of the scheme to be launched in June. Uplift of the sitting of the on the job training allowance payable to employers under the Labor Department's employment program for the elderly and middle age, the youth employment and training program, the work orientation and placement scheme, together with payment of retention allowance on a pilot basis to an eligible employees engaged under these programs. And also two rounds of the one off living subsidy for low income households not living in public housing and not receiving CSSA program, and one round of the one of allowance for new arrivals from low-income families program launched by the Community Care Fund. In addition, the government has launched the time-limited special scheme of assistance to the unemployed under CSSA scheme to temporarily relax the asset limits for the able-bodied persons by 100% for 12 months from June 2020 to May 2021. The government, during the six-month period from April to September this year, will implement the time-limited new arrangement under the special scheme. Specifically, the cash value of insurance policies of able-bodied CSSA applicants will not be counted as asset during the grace period of one year. The financial sector will also allocate $6.6 billion to create another 30,000 time-limited jobs. We will continue to listen to the views of the public and provide more assistance for the unemployed and the families in light of the development and needs. Thank you, President. Mr. Jimmy mm. Thank you, President. Every time we mention support to enterprises and employees, the Secretary will then uh, um, roll out a host of measures implemented by the government. But in addition to what the government has done, we want to know how effective they've been in this year's budget. Now, uh, for AEF and also the budget together has launched a number of relief measures involving over $300 billion, accounting for about 5% of our GDP. Of course, the government is willing uh, to heavily support employees and also enterprises. In general, they will uh, serve some effect, but you have to bear in mind that our unemployment rate has reached a 17-year high to 7.2%. Many enterprises cannot remain afloat anymore, and um, unemployed persons are crying out for help. Has the government ever reviewed 
the effectiveness of different support measures. And if they are not effective, shouldn't they be uh, improved? And if the government is not doing enough, shouldn't it do more? Secretary. For uh, all items, we do have a review plan. For instance, uh, ESS in the question of in the member's question, because we still have outstanding work. So at the latest stage, uh, when uh, the ESS is more or less complete, we will conduct a review. But of course, we don't have to wait until the whole program is over before we review it. We've been monitoring the information, information such as uh, the impact on the various sectors. Now, if you look at the overall figures, in uh, July to, 11, uh, to November last year, ESS had indeed lowered the impact on our labor market by the pandemic. Now, in July last year, when we had the third wave, now if we compare that to the situation to a few uh, months ahead, in fact, uh, there were 50 percent, 50,000 increase in the number of um, employees. So the situation was improved a bit. But of course, an, an overall review will have to wait until the SS is completed and will give an account to the Council. Mr. Christopher Jiang. Thank you, President. The epidemic has uh, gone on for more than a year. Many sectors, the tourism, uh, catering and retail industries infected, uh, in particular, are hard hit. The government should help provide relief to them. Now, for the financial services sector, the small and medium-sized uh, brokerages have been hard hit as well. You may think that because the securities market is uh, very uh, active, we are not affected. But this is not really the case. We have uh, $200, $300 billion of turnover per day, and our IPOs are very um, successful. But all these business is being uh, swallowed by the large uh, brokerages and uh, for the small and medium sized uh, brokers and agents and uh, back office staff, they are still on no pay leave. Now, because of the keen competition, uh, we are very much affected, and most support measures from the government are for the unemployed. What about those whose wages have been uh, reduced or on no pay leave, they are not getting any help. Will the government consider launching new measures to help people whose uh, income has been affected, in particular petitioners in the financial service sector, to help them tell for the difficult period? Or will you uh, launch a long schemes so that members of the financial services sector and even the self-employed will still be eligible to apply? Thank you. Uh, regarding the situation in the financial services sector, I'm sure uh, the FSTB are uh, very concerned about them. And I understand that uh, Mr. Stephen Zhang will also reflect our views to them. And I uh, will uh, relay the um, issues raised by Mr. Christopher Zhang to the Revenue Bureau. Now, because of the epidemic, many employers can't afford to keep the total headcount if all of them uh, still do not take no pay leave. And therefore, there is this arrangement of job sharing. For instance, instead of working for five days, you go to work for four days. If you do not share the job, that, in fact, uh, the employer can lay off 20 percent of uh, the headcount. And this is the flexibility of our market, so that in a mutually understanding manner, we can then adapt to the new business environment. Of course, taking no, leave, no pay leave would affect income, but that is better than for 20 to 40 percent of the staff being dismissed. So. I hope both employers and employees can uh, face uh, this economic situation together. Mr. Felix Chong. Thank you, President. Two weeks ago, uh, President, you went to uh, Beijing to attend meetings of um, uh, for CCP and, and then uh, 
when uh, the conference closed, uh, there was a press conference. The media asked uh, uh, Vice Premier Mr. Li Keqiang. Now, uh, the uh, question was, uh, China's been very successful in controlling the uh, pandemic, and what are the um, uh, reasons for that? And then uh, Mr. Li said that it is important to keep the enterprises afloat so the jobs can be kept and unemployment rates will not rise. The Secretary said that for the two trenches of ESS, they were successful in uh, helping uh, to lower the unemployment rate. But now the rate uh, stands at 7.2 percent, and uh, the Secretary said that uh, there is every chance that the rate will continue to rise. Uh, our Vice Premier Li said that keeping enterprises can then keep our employees. So why can't you have a third trench of ESS in order to contain the unemployment rate? Why not? Now you can see that uh, people are unemployed and unemployment rate is rising and the government is numb to uh, their plight. Why isn't the government launching a third trench of ESS? Secretary, uh, both uh, the FS and the C have uh, taken uh, similar questions from members. Well, in designing ESS last year, we really didn't know how long the pandemic would last. Even today, we're not sure when the pandemic will end. Back then, we are considering whether uh, we should have each trench lasting three months or six months, and we wanted to uh, invite applications within a few weeks' time. So the design uh, was very simple. I think there was a thorough debate in the Finance Committee of this Council back then whether we wanted uh, more time uh, for a better design or do we, do we want the scheme to be simple and straightforward so the applications could start within a few weeks. So we spent about $90 billion or $45 billion in each trench under ESS. Can we be more focused? Yes, we have tried. Now, for large enterprises, if uh, they would only be eligible to apply, if uh, they proved that they were uh, making a deficit, then we could at most uh, save $10 billion and we would still have to spend $35 billion in each trench. So we had great reservations. And um, many ask whether we can have the third or even the fourth trench of uh, ESS. I think that question was um, already addressed in the past. Your question not answered? Of course not. I'm asking them uh, to implement ESS to contain unemployment. I did not ask him to explain the whole uh, operation. My question was whether yes or no. FS well, already, I mean, uh, Secretary already answered that question. It's out of um, financial considerations. Mr. Yu Si Wing, it was just announced that in the past uh, three months, unemployment rate rose to 7.2 percent. Uh, the unemployment rate among um, tourism-related industry was higher, 11 percent. Uh, the uh, tourism sector has been frozen for one year, and there is no uh, idea when we uh, can revive. So how are you going to uh, review measures to help them? The Secretary had not said no to this, but uh, for sectors particularly uh, hard hit by the pandemic, how are you going to uh, help the employers and employees of these sectors? Secretary. Well, and different policy bureaus do uh, care of the employees under uh, their respective uh, policy areas. And the question is, uh, how much can be done with our resources? Now, uh, we have extended some items of uh, AEF. Some of uh, the um, uh, measures have been improved or enhanced, uh, but that's within our financial capability. Some sectors will face a prolonged adjustment. So we are thinking how we can assess uh, these employees. If need be, they, uh, if they want to uh, switch the, their um, uh, trade, how we can help. We hope that under the special love upgrading scheme run by the ERB, we can help these employees to tie over the difficult period.
Mr. Yu Xiuwing, what is your question? I'm asking, under what circumstances are they going to uh, extend a helping hand to industries, particularly hard hit? As I said, it depends on the circumstances and also our financial capability. Mr. Shuka Fai, some industries uh, when could not operate for over 200 days because of the epidemic, as Mr. Uh, Tommy Jung said, uh, some uh, clubs, bars, karaoke's, starting uh, from the 2nd of December to now, has been over three months. They are not allowed to operate, but they have to continue to pay rent. Uh, some uh, employees may be on no pay leave, but some are still receiving a pay. Uh, some association uh, clubs and trades uh, came to me uh, not long ago telling me that they are heavily indebted. So, so for uh, uh, shops and uh, trades that uh, were not allowed to operate for three months, how can they survive? Now, if another round of ESS cannot help all the um, businesses in Hong Kong, but for premises that were not allowed to operate, can you give them uh, special consideration so that they don't have to wind up sector? Yes, I can uh, re relay uh, the uh, um, to the Revenue Bureaus uh, the need of different sectors. Mr. Lo Kwok Wing, Lo, Lo Wai Kwok. Yes, the first and second trenches of ESS has helped employees uh, to stay in job and to help um, enterprises in difficulties to continue to uh, pay the employees, but then the second trench has closed for a while, and still I'm receiving calls for assistance from individual enterprises. They of the view that for the second trench, perhaps because of um, communication breakdown, or or perhaps because they could not approach. Uh, the relevant enterprises or organizations or the applications were not granted, and then uh, they were only informed after a long time, and the time for uh, making representations was lost. I'm not referring to individual cases, but I hope the secretary can be more lenient because enterprises want to keep their employees, and I hope you will not be too strict, secretary. I said in my main reply, and the second trench of ESS is already closed, and we are dealing with um, employers that have not fulfilled the relevant uh, terms and conditions, and we may have to issue uh, penalty uh, notices and uh, referral to various cases. In fact, all the cases have been uh, processed. Thank you. Question two, Mr. Martin Liao. President, since last year, a number of international organizations such as the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have one after another and on a number of occasions called on the governments of various countries to promote a post epidemic green recovery of their economies and to steer their economic revitalization measures along the direction of green and low carbon transformation and sustainable development. China has also called on various countries to seize the historic opportunities presented by the new round of scientific and technological revolution and industrial transformation and promote a post-epidemic green recovery of the world economy. The Hong Kong SAR government has also stated that it will support a green recovery of the economy. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the plans and measures to promote a post-epidemic green recovery of Hong Kong's economy in respect of each measure, the anticipated manpower and expenditure involved, economic benefits to be generated, and implementation timetable, and how the measures will help Hong Kong reach its la latest targets of achieving carbon neutrality before 2050. Two, of the plans and measures to support Hong Kong's various sectors in seizing the green economic opportunities in the, in the short, medium and long terms in areas such as green finance, green innovation and technology, as well as green industries. And three, whether it has assessed the respective green employment opportunities to be brought by the aforesaid measures for Hong Kong. 
whether it has set new targets, including those relating to economic benefits and employment opportunities for the future developments of Hong Kong's environmental industry, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for the Environment. President, as the COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a heavy, heavy blow to our economy, all departments of the Hong Kong SAR government are committed to boosting the economy and creating job opportunities in various industries. In terms of environmental protection, the, Envir the Environment Bureau has adopted a number of new measures on the promotion of clean energy and renewable energy, energy efficiency, green building, green transportation, waste reduction and recycling, green infrastructure and green innovative technologies. These measures will not only create green economic and employment opportunities and promote a green recovery, but will also continuously improve the environment and help Hong Kong move towards the goal of achieving carbon neutrality before 2050. To promote cleaner energy, the two power companies will continue to renew their gas-fired generating units to replace the coal-fired ones and develop an onshore liquefied natural gas terminal. On renewable energy, the government launched the feed-in tariffs in 2018 and solar harvest to install solar energy generation systems for schools and welfare organizations. Together with other facilitation measures, more than 180 million kilowatt hours of renewable energy can be produced. It is expected that the above-mentioned measures will create more than 5,000 jobs in relevant industries. The government also set aside a total of $3 billion to install small-scale RE systems on government premises. It is expected that about 27 million kilowatt hours of electricity will be generated per annum. To help various sectors save energy and reduce carb uh, carbon emissions, the government introduced the $600 million Green Schools 2.0 Energy Smart Program and the $150 million Green Welfare NGOs to conduct energy audits and install energy saving devices for primary and secondary schools and social welfare organizations. The program will achieve an electricity saving of 45 million kilowatt kilowatt hours per annum. The government will also construct an additional district cooling system in the Kaidak development area and new district cooling systems in Tongchong, New Tang Extension East and Kun Tong North, new development area respectively. The three projects will, with a total construction cost of about $14 billion can, can create saving of about 130 million kilowatt hours of electricity per annum and also create more than 1,600 1, job opportunities. In order to promote green transportation, the government has aside more than $10 billion last year to launch a series of measures, including the $2 billion EV charging at home subsidy scheme and the $7.1 billion Excrucia payment scheme to phase out about 40,000 Euro for diesel commercial vehicles. These measures can provide more than 700 jobs. On waste management, more than 700 job opportunities will be created by various measures on waste reduction and recycling, including collection and recycling services for waste papers, food waste and waste plastic, green communities recycling networks, including recycling stations, recycling stores and recycling spots, and the reverse vending ma machine pilot sch scheme for plastic beverage containers. The government will commence a number of green infrastructure projects in the coming three years, including construction and upgrading of sewerage treatment works, improvements and expansion of sewerage systems, rehabilitation of aging sewers, installation of dry weather flow interceptors, and retrofitting of noise barriers or enclosures at suitable existing road sec sections. The above green infrastructure projects are estimated to involve a total expenditure of about, of about $14 billion and create 1,700 jobs. To capitalize on the enormous green finance opportunities, the government plans to expand the scale of the government's green bond program and arrange for the regular issuance of green bond totaling $175.5 billion within the next five years, having regard to the market situation. We will also launch the Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme to provide subsidy for eligible entities to cover their expenses on bond issuance and external review services, which will enhance our position as a green finance hub in the region. In addition, the government has set up a $200 million green tech fund to provide better and more focused funding support to research and development projects which can help Hong Kong decarbonize and enhance environmental protection. It will promote the application of innovative technologies and create hundreds of job opportunities. As a whole, the above mentioned resources devoted by the government can create more than 5,000 employment opportunities in the coming few years. The government's policy on carbon reduction in electricity generation will also drive investments in the private sector, creating another 5,000 or more employment opportunities. In total, more than 10,000 job opportunities will be created to support a green recovery. In the 
medium and long terms, the government will continue to promote green economic opportunities in various aspects in the course of striving towards carbon neutrality. For example, the government announced the Waste Blueprint for Hong Kong 2035 in February this year, setting out the vision of waste reduction, resources circulation, and zero landfill, and outlining the strategies, goals, and measures to meet the challenges of waste management up to 2035. Besides, we will allocate another $1 billion to the recycling fund to further support the upgrading and transformation of the recycling trade. This will benefit more than 1,000 recycling enterprises, providing thousands of employment opportunities and help develop a circular economy. Hong Kong's first roadmap on the popularization of EVs to be announced today will set out a long-term target and related measures to cease the new registration of fuel propelled private, private cars in or before 2035, providing new development opportunities for EVs and the relevant trades in the medium and long terms. Later this year, we will update a clean air plan for Hong Kong 2035 to formulate new targets and measures to further improve air quality. We will also update the Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan to set up long-term strategies for achieving carbon neutrality. These policy blueprints will establish new targets which are closely related to green finance, green innovative technology, and green industry, and will con continuously promote the development of green economy in Hong Kong in the medium and long terms and create more green employment opportunities in the future. Thank you, President. Mr. Martin Liao. President. In terms of green recovery or low carbon economy, it has a very wide coverage. The Secretary is right that all these opportunities are interlinked. For example, green finance can finance the development of green innovation and technologies and also generate demand for uh, advisory services and um, insurance. However, the Secretary is only repeating the government's environmental protection policy. The Secretary has not presented the macro picture to us. Now the department, the Bureau will only consolidate the data concerning the development of the environmental friendly industries. Will the government give us a more comprehensive set of figures for us to trace the development of the green economy in Hong Kong? Secretary? I thank the member for caring about the development of the green industry as well as the job opportunities provided. Now we have the blueprints which have set out a clear direction for the development of green industry as well as the jobs created. Looking forward, we will collect more comprehensive data as well as carry out more in-depth analysis concerning these data. We will. Uh, we have heard um, the members' uh, view. We will um, do that so that we can have a more complete set of data to chart our medium to long-term uh, policy. We will tap into the economic opportunities brought about by the green recovery. Thank you. This is Regina Ip. President, for some green um, industry uh, practitioner, um, there are some who are, um, who are fake. That's why we have the term greenwashing. Now, the international society is very concerned about whether corporates uh, comply with the ESG standard. There are lots of ratings as well as um, regulatory um, authority, for example, Standard and & Poor's and Reuters and so on. So will you, will the Secretary advise to the Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury whenever there is an investment into green sector, the government at uh, the bank should provide them with uh, a low interest loan. And also the government should publish, uh, should publish the uh, green ratings for companies and encourage citizens to uh, not to invest in um, those doing poorly. I thank Mrs. Virginia for her views. 
I would like to reiterate two points. First, to achieve carbon neutrality, we need to work together among bureaus and departments. That's why we have been working with the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau in the issuance of the government's green bond. And also we have consulted the industry on uh, ensuring the ESG standard of companies. And also we have stepped up communication with the sector. We have set up platforms comprising governments and private sectors representatives to make the rating mechanism more scientific and objective. And also we have a set of policies to support that. Thank you. Mr. Ma Bong Kwok. In the past, eco-friendly industry has been regarded as our advantageous industry. It can create a lot of jobs because it is a labor-intensive industry. However, we haven't seen much progress. In foreign countries, green scientific projects can be can start a very quickly. Under the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of surgical masks and PPEs um, are discarded as waste. According to media reports, in European countries, there are companies to there are companies recycling or even up recycling uh, these waste uh, these waste products. It seems that we are lagging far behind. Has the government started work in this regard? For example, are there any studies concerning the recycling of uh, PPE or wasted medical products? And also, and also in the invitation of tender in the Eco Park for recycling um, wasted paper by using pulping facility, um, I would like to know the progress. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Ma. Um, Mr. Ma mentioned that we are going to invite tender for a pulping facility in Eco Park to turn waste paper into pulp and export them to um, different places, including the mainland, as resources. This is um, ongoing. We are going to start inviting tender in the second quarter this year. In terms of our policy, according to our um, waste blueprints for Hong Kong 2035, we have adopted a different mindset as compared with before. Previously, we adopted a um, the government's participation was not much because uh, the mark because um there was enough market incentives. However, at present, the private sectors um, cannot run on a self financing model concerning the recycling of uh, waste plastic. Uh, waste, um, kitchen waste, um, and so on. That's why we are going to provide uh, subsidies um, to them uh, concerning logistics because uh, it makes up for a large part of the operational cost. Mr. Gary Chen, uh, thank you. The secretary told us there are a lot of green activities going on in Hong Kong. However, the green infrastructure projects are not realized. I would like to follow up for Mr. Ma Fong Kwok. The paper recycling project claimed that um, it would be able to recycle um, some 3 million tons of uh, waste paper every year. The contractor withdrew um, the bid for tender. That's why the site was laid uh, vacant for two years. Now, the secretary told us um, there is another project that is the um, modern recycling facility for waste paper. But what, is, what about the previous tender, which um, did not succeed? 
was compensation paid to the government? And also, um, are we going to have more green infrastructure? Secretary, thank you, um, Mr. Chen. The case is being handled by the court. That's why I'm not going to um, comment on the case. There is indeed opportunity in paper recycling business. Previously, the paper recycling industry relied on um, conventional technology. That's why more water and electricity was needed. However, with the tightening of, of, um, of regulation measures in the mainland, the technology of handling uh, paper pulp has advanced a lot in recent years. That's why we would like to make use of this opportunity. In Hong Kong, we lack um, land as, and also our electricity and water um, is more costly. That's why we would like the contractor to make use of the latest technology to upcycle our waste paper. We will speed up the process of tender invitation. This is a new technology and less space will be required. So we hope that the pulping facility can be commissioned as soon as possible. And also, the pulping facility will not just handle ordinary um, waste paper from office, newspapers, and so on. For paper waste, which could not be exported before, the pulping facility can also recycle them and the stress on our landfill will be alleviated. Mr. Vincent Cheng, President, we already have the goal of carbon neutrality before 2050. As the Chairman of the Panel on Environmental Affairs, I have seen a lot of environmental blueprints being uh, rolled out. For example, EV charging at home and green community program and green infrastructure. This is the right direction to go. It seems that the major difficulty lies in the lack of enough stakeholders and also the lack of talents nurturing. We cannot just rely on the Environment Bureau to do it, Environmental Protection Bureau to do it. I've been working with the Environmental Protection Bureau um, concerning um, a project as well as a, uni a university, and that was very good. I think we can work more in hand uh, with university as well as um, other organizations so that we can extend the reach of these uh, programs. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Zhang. At the end of last year, we have rolled out a green tech fund to support innovative environmental researchers. We encourage universities to work with uh, businesses so that um, the application can be more uh, suitable. Now, um, as at the end of February, in the first round of application, we have already received uh, some 190 applications by the by the, the middle of this year, we will be able to complete vetting uh, these applications. And secondly, in dealing with climate change, we have to have inter-bureau efforts. So when we update the climate climate change um, climate action plan, we will bring in the efforts from other bureaus as well. And also, we will need the sectors to work together with us. I also urge members to work to, together with us to promote um, the to promote um, environmental protection among uh, citizens. Thank you, Chairman. Due to the epidemic, the Kai Tak cruise terminal has not had vessels for many months. The operator has pointed out that in the past, most of the cruise passengers they had. 
inconvenience because they had to queue for a long time, carrying bulky land, luggage, uh, travel for, with taxis is inconvenient. On the other hand, the government had set aside six sites nearby to be built as hotels and the remaining f four of them would be rezoned for residential flats. So some members of the tourism industry feel that the government should improve ancillary transport and accommodation facilities to offer a better travel experience for cruise passengers. So can the government inform this council, one, whether it has plans in the coming three years to provide car parks on the idle sites near uh, Kai Tak Cruise Terminal? So local residents going on a cruise trip may choose to travel by private car and shorten the queue for taxis. And if there are details, they could uh, disclose them. And if not, so what are the reasons? Second, whether it has plans in the coming three years to introduce water taxi services plying between the cruise terminal and Kuntong Public Pier for use by cruise passengers, thereby shortening the queue for taxis and alleviating traffic load on roads. And if we have, do we have the details? And if not, for, why not? And third, whether it will keep the afford said two sites for hotel use so as to address the accommodation needs of cruise passengers in the future. If not, why not? Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. Thank you, Mrs. Regina Yip, for the question. After consulting Development Bureau, Transport and Housing Bureau, I'll uh, provide the following reply. In light of overall development, the government has been enhancing public transport services to meet development needs and the demand of cruise passengers. We have franchise bus, green mini bus, serving Kuntong, Kowloon City, the cruise terminal, as well as ferry services connecting North Point, Kuntong, and Kai Tak Runway Park. When there are ships calling at the cruise terminal, the operator will arrange extra shuttle bus services for cruise passengers and also provide ship call information to taxi trade in order to cater to the extra traffic demand. According to T-Day Transport, Depor Transport Department survey conducted in early 2020, the average waiting time is, was less than five minutes. In addition, the Civil Engineering and Development Department has completed road improvement works connecting Cruise Terminal and Kowloon Bay. It should be completed by uh, 2022, and we also expect that the road D3 located uh, north of the former runway will substantially be completed by 2022. We also see that the existing road and railway infrastructure, as well as public transport services at Kai Tak, the government now proposes to implement a multimodal, environmentally friendly linkage system that includes electric buses, mini bus services, travel later network, pedestrian and cycling paths, water taxis, etc to connect railway stations, business districts, and public transport institutions at Kai Tak, Kuntong, Otao Gok, and Kowloon Bay. This will enhance connectivity in the area and at the same time facilitate cruise passengers traveling to different places. Uh, in reply to Ms. Regina Zip, three questions, I have the following response. The cruise terminal be is suspending immigration services because of the epidemic. When we resume services in the future the public transport uh, services including taxis and shuttle buses should be able to cater to passenger demand the government also encourages cruise passengers to use public transport between to travel to and from the cruise terminal the government has no plans to provide substantial parking space in the vicinity for cruise passengers in fact, the cruise terminal provides 120 public parking spaces for private cars, and the adjacent Kai Tak Tourism Node also reserves another 100 parking spaces for private cars. Second, in respect of waterborne traffic, as I said earlier, we already have ferry service between Kuntong Kai Tak during weekends. The TD will negotiate with the operator if necessary.
The TD is also working with relevant operator on water taxi service connecting Kai Tak Hong Hum Jim Sa Joy, West Kowloon Cultural District, and the trial service is expected to be launched in the second half of 2021. Now, third, in light of the latest economic situation, the Development Bureau is examining the feasibility of rezoning five commercial sites into residential use, and three of those are located next to the cruise terminal. The Kaitak Tourism node adjacent to cruise terminal will provide a minimum of 15% of total gross floor area for hotel use. Now, in general, the cruise passengers' demand for hotel accommodation are not that high because the cruise passengers from overseas they have accommodation on the cruise and they will visit different places in Hong Kong for shopping or sightseeing and they will not stay near the cruise terminal area. In any event, we will monitor the hotel demand for of cruise passengers and continue to review hotel supply in Hong Kong and consult with the relevant bureau and departments. Thank you. Ms. Regina Yip. Now, Hong Kong, first of all, we have we are the calling port for a lot of cruise uh, routes, so the passengers might arrive a day or two early, stay in hotels, and before they board the cr uh, cruise. So they have a lot of luggage, so having a water taxi and minibus is not convenient. And uh, as you know, the outbreak even though we have an outbreak around the world, they do have local tours. So it's similar to staycation locally. So these uh, tourists are a family. They would have to take public, uh, it's not convenient for them to take taxis, water taxis and mini buses. So the industry has uh, suggested setting aside some space for park and cruise. That would be for the longer term, but would you help out in providing uh, tourism in our uh, waters. Thank you, Mrs. Yip, for your quest for your suggestions. The hotel facilities in Hong Kong are sufficient, especially uh, it might take time to recover after the epidemic. Regarding travel arrangements, I'm aware that public transport, the bus routes, they do have facilities for luggage. And when the cruise arrives in Hong Kong, typically they have dedicated shuttle buses and in light of your second part of the question, we have contacted the tourism sector, including cruise operators. As Ms. Mrs. Regina Yip says, in the last few years, we want they ha there is an opportunity to develop Hong Kong as a port of call for cruise, for cruises. Now, there are difficulties in recent years because we've had outbreak on cruises and even also occurred in Hong Kong. So the tourism sector has mentioned uh, having cruises to nowhere uh, or staycations. So we will discuss with the industry. The first obstacle is they have to comply with inspection testing requirements. If you recall, having hotels as quarantine facilities uh, also ran into a lot of problems. We have to look into management, air ventilation, and other factors. The second criteria is whether you, we would have confidence in having mass travel because there are a lot of people congregating. We had discussed with the industry and center of for health protection. So when the situation improves, we can look into this. Ms. Yong Hoi-an, 
I note that in answer three, the Development Bureau is looking to rezone five sites into residential use. Well, have you assessed that uh, previously it was for hotel use and you want to convert to residential use? Would that lead to greater traffic demand because there is insufficient infrastructure support now? We don't have enough minibuses, buses, taxis, and we don't even have the water taxi service. If you rezone it for residential use, will that lead to a heavier traffic demand? Now, that involves planning and transportation. So before I hand it over to Development Bureau, I just want to reiterate that when the cruise op cruises arrive in Hong Kong, there is a special arrangement. They will uh, inform the taxi trade, and the taxi trade will provide more taxis. Uh, the cruise operators also arrange for shuttle bus services for the cruise passengers and uh, if these cruise passengers are locals they are familiar with traffic options uh, so in East Kowloon or Diamond Hill there are shopping centers for non-local tourists the purpose is to uh, reduce the demand for traffic Development Bureau. Thank you, Ms. Yong. In 2017, the government set six sites of commercial land and took four of them to, and converted it to residential use. The other two sites were reserved for commercial use. But in light of the latest economic situation and our recurrent need for housing supply so we're now converting five sites of land and looking into the feasibility of converting it to residential use we'll have an outcome by the end of the year and depending on the outcome uh, we will activate or proceed with town planning procedures so initially we feel we can provide some 5800 housing units so in this feasibility study whether it is suitable to convert for residential use, it depends on the individual land use. So we need technical assessment, traffic, infrastructure, uh, all these have to be feasible before we can initiate the town planning procedures. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Frankie Yick. Thank you, Chairman. In paragraph 3, the secretary mentions that the queuing time for taxis is typically less than five minutes, according to TD. Well, but uh, secretary, have you tried the cruise services? I can tell you definitely it's not five minutes. I went there myself. So whenever cruises uh, arrive, I, my phone rings off the hook. Uh, there are calls for assistance. Now, Miss Regina asked for parking space. Now, we can see that the design of the cruise terminal, uh, it was built on the concept of just a birthing um, terminal. Uh, we don't even have sufficient dining facilities at the terminal. It, it wasn't designed as a call of port. Now, the operator, they, their estimate was uh, much more accurate, much better than the government. So, f from it's, instead of being a, instead of uh, serving as a birthing terminal, uh, they had designs for a port of call, and they needed sufficient parking space. So this is my follow-up question. We have an, a, a, a piece of land opposite the terminal. 
since there is no fixed plan, can we increase parking space? Thank you, Mr. Yik, for your suggestion and question. The survey results I quoted just now were from TD. Now, we do, we are in communication with the operator. The service providers such as taxis are in close contact. If there is business to be done, there will be people trying to meet that need. And regarding traffic parking space, I mentioned that the terminal has 100 parking spaces and the high-tech node also has another 100 parking spaces. I'm aware in East Kowloon, in the future sports park, there would be a lot of parking spaces as well. There would be some 800 parking spaces in the sports center. The whole Kaitak area is connected, including connection to the MTR. So we believe that it would improve after all the works are completed. So speaking on behalf of TD, if we want to meet all vehicle demand, this might not be the most appropriate arrangement. Well, we have to rely on public transport, for example. When the cruises arrive, there's extra bus service and our buses have luggage facilities. So we will review the situation and uh, hope, and after the epidemic, we hope uh, to cater to these needs, Mr. Lok Jong Hong. The Kai Tak Cruise Terminal serves local residents as well as tourists. Now, we would like water taxis to provide service as soon as possible. Now, this reminds me of a environmental friendly link system that was abandoned. But now we have an opportunity in the response to the third question. The government said that they would rezone three sites out of five into residential use. Now, according to the media, there would be 5,800 units uh, available, and uh, the cost would amount to more than 50 billion. The Kaitak Environmental Friendly Link, is there any opportunity for it to be revived? And would you consider the FTU's proposal? Just having a short connection to the Kaitak station. Thank you for the question. Now, Kowloon East Environmental Friendly Link, uh, we had announced the, the feasibility study has been concluded. So even when we rezone the commercial land to residential use, the traffic impact isn't that significant. Uh, when we did the feasibility study, we had anticipated all, after all the future development was completed, we saw that economically and technically it wasn't that feasible. Now, could we connect Kaitak to the end of the runway? We had looked into that as well and for, same, for similar reasons, we found that it wasn't feasible financially. So we suggest a multimodal system, and that would include electric vehicles running on uh, the minibus and bus routes, and having a travel laders connecting to the end of the runway, uh, to connecting to Kuntong, Kowloon Bay, and also providing pedestrian and cycling paths along the promenade and also creating a landscaped platform connecting to Kuntong MTR and so on. 
So all these will improve the accessibility. Now even if we complete a part of it, the, the suspended, it, uh, it's not necessary to uh, build the suspended uh, links. The public and industry are concerned about the cruise, whether, when it can be open. Just now Mrs. Regina if also said that some countries and jurisdictions, including Taiwan, Singapore, and countries in Europe, are already relaxing cruise operations. So under what conditions will you meet with the industry uh, regarding the uh, reopening of the terminal? W when will you contact the operators? Uh, Secretary, thank you, Mr. Yu. If we are to allow or relax cruise operator, a uh, cruise terminal operation, first of all, the epidemic has to, uh, the epidemic situation has to be under control. Uh, we also have to have confidence in uh, in uh, the epidemic situation in other countries uh, we there is a lot of work involved and the whole industry faced many difficulties so in this respect we have to keep an eye on the epidemic but we're not it's just sitting on our thumbs the industry is also helping itself uh, where they can. They want to test crews and passengers. I think uh, Hong Kong people will accept that, and uh, the f ventilation, uh, infection, the food and beverage, the number of people, and uh, changing f room facilities and so on. All these can be improved, and that is when this epidemic comes under better control, when everybody feels safe, when everything. When other countries are doing a good job, we can look into uh, operating the cruises again. And as Mrs. Regina Ip said, we can have cruises to nowhere. Uh, we can, uh, but ultimately, the epidemic has to be under control, and uh, we can even start with uh, vaccinations. Question for the Honourable Lao Kuo Fan. Thank you, President. There are views that the government should optimize the use of the lands surrounding various boundary crossings in the new territories in order to develop port economy and increase housing supply. However, the government has not made holistic considerations in respect of the development of such lands, resulting in large tracts of agricultural land and fish ponds having been left deserted for a long time. In this connection, would the government inform this council, one, whether it has compiled statistics on the current total area of the deserted agricultural lands and fish ponds surrounding various boundary crossings in the NT, of the plans in place to unleash their development potential, whether it will conduct an overall planning for the deserted lands, including rezoning such as land for the redevelopment of uh, NTAs or new towns, thereby increasing housing supply. Two, of his new thinking on putting the lands surrounding various boundary crossings in the NT to optimal use, such as whether it will construct office buildings for relevant government departments and develop a center for innovative industries on such lands so as to develop a port economic, economic zone, where thereby better seizing the opportunities brought by the development of the Hong Kong Guangdong Macau GBA, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Three, whether well, we will consider setting up an ad hoc committee to study the implementation of and conduct holistic planning for the development projects on the land surrounding various boundary crossings in the NT, as well as coordinate the implementation of the REM projects, if so, of the details, not the reasons for that. Section for development. President, other than the Shamjan Bay port, there are six land boundary control points at Hong Kong and Shamjan boundary, including Lok Ma Chow, Lok Ma Chow Spur Line, Low Wu Meng Kam To, Hang Yun Wai, and Sha Tau Kok boundary control points. In planning a spatial layout of Hong Kong, consideration will be given 
to how to leverage the geographical advantages of land near the boundary crossings with view to meeting the demand for land in Hong Kong and facilitating economic development. The Hong Kong 2030 Plus towards a planning vision and strategic transcending 2030 study recommended to develop a north economic belt in the northern part of NT. The economic belt extending from Lok March and west to Hong Yuan is not only for increasing housing land but also for research and development, modern logistics, warehousing, and other emerging industries. The Hong Kong Shanghai Innovation and Technology Park in the Lok Ma Chao Loop and the new development area in the NT North fall on this development access, and these industries can fully leverage the geographical advantages and developmental potential of the area. With regard to various parts of the question, after consulting the relevant policy bureaus and departments, our reply as follows. According to Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, about, uh, currently the total area of farmland in Hong Kong is about 4,200 hectares, about 20% of which is under active farming, and the total area of fish ponds is about 1,100 hectares of which 10% is used for fish culture. These farmland and fish ponds are mainly located in the northwest NT with some near boundary control points. In the course of land use planning, including new development areas, full consideration is given to how best utilize the geographical advantages of the area. However, whether the land is currently deserted is not the main consideration. Uh, for developing a site. Instead, the shape, area, and topography surrounding developments, ecological and environmental constraints, and provision of infrastructure are more important. At present, we've included areas in the vicinity of Lok Ma Chow, Lok Ma Chow Spur Line, Man Kam To, Hang Yun Wai boundary control points in the NTN NDA under planning. The NTN NDA covers over 1,400 hectares of land comprising three. Potential development areas, PDAs, i.e. Sentin Lok Ma Chow Development Note, the NTN New Town covering Hang Yun Wai Ping Che, Ta Ku Ling, Hang Long Hang, and Queen's Hill and Mankam To Logistics Corridor. Our main planning concept is to build the new towns, the infrastructure, and ancillary facilities through comprehensive planning and making optimal use of land covering brownfield sites and farmland to meet the long-term social and economic developments of Hong Kong. The NTN NDA has easy access to and from Shamchan and East in Guangdong and the uh, geographically well-suited for research and development, modern logistics, warehousing and storage as well as emerging industries. Synergy can therefore be achieved with the Hong Kong Shamchan INT Park in the Lok Ma Chao Loop and the scientific research and technology developments in Shamchan Jan, thus grasping the opportunities for development in the mainland. This is also in line with the development strategy of the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau GBA, under which the central government strongly supports the cooperation between Hong Kong and Samjan in developing an international INT hub. Concerning the Santin Lok Ma Chao development note, a study has been com a study commenced in September 2019. Preliminary assessment shows that the development note with an area of about 320 hectares with the northern Link under planning will have the potential for medium to high density development, yielding about 31,000 residential flats, 7% being public housing, providing home for 84,000 residents and about 64,000 jobs. And 50% uh, of 50 hectares or 80% of the note will be designated for enterprise and technology path for corporate offices and information technology use. This will time with the adjoining development of the Hong Kong Shamjan INT Park in the Long March and achieve synergy. Since Hong Kong and Shamjan governments have agreed on obtaining the central government support for the implementation of the co-location arrangements at the redeveloped Huang Kong port, 20 hectares of land can be released at the existing Lok Ma Chow boundary control point for other users and will consider as a whole how to utilize such release land when planning for the development note. The Mankam To Logistics Corridor and NTN New Town in proximity of Mankam To boundary control point and Hang Yun Wai boundary control point respectively cover an even large area totaling about 1,140 hectares are expected to accommodate at least 200,000 residents and provide about 134,000 jobs. We will explore how these areas can tie with the development trend of GBA and formulate plans for the industries and new jobs in the area with a view to boosting Hong Kong's economic vibrancy, creating job opportunities in these areas, and thereby easing the problem of over-concentration of jobs in the urban areas. For example, we've reserved 56 hectares of land in the proximity of Hung Yun Wang 
BCP for Development of Science Park or Industrial Estate. Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation has completed a visionary study for developing the land as a new industrial estate and settled mode and direction of development, and we commence the engineering and technical feasibility study in the same quarter of 2021. In the course of planning, NTN NDA will reserve land for government institutions and community facilities, including government offices, as appropriate. In fact, the plan is to orderly move large government offices from core business areas to various locations for effective land use. In other NDAs, such as Hong Shui Kyo Hachun NDA, land is also reserved for large scale government complex facilities to serve the local community. To take forward the three projects of NTN NDA, the government intends to submit funding application to the Legislative Council the first half of this year. The funding will cover the investigation and design for Senti Lok Ma Chow Development Note, as well as the planning and engineering study of the NTN New Town and Mankam to Logistics Corridor in advance. Three, the government has set up appropriate steering and coordinating mechanisms at different levels to take forward land development. The Development Bureau has a team led by a directorate officer responsible for coordinating with departments to offer holistic and comprehensive considerations at the land and project planning stage for the various NDAs in the NT and developments in the vicinity of the boundary crossings. There are also teams led by directorate officers under the Civil Engineering and Development Bureau Department to liaise closely with the relevant departments during the process of implementing the projects so that the works of site formation, infrastructure, and various public facilities are carried out in a timely and orderly manner. Now, we do not have any plan to set up an ad hoc committee specifically for developments near boundary crossing points. Thank you. Mr. Alcock Fan. So uh, the secretary said that they have always uh, been uh, thinking how to uh, uh, optimize land use near our boundary control points. But the reality is uh, the land there is um, rather undeveloped, a uh, stark uh, opposition from what's happening in Guangdong or uh, uh, Shenzhen. Now we have 40. 200 hectares of land, farmland not used, and also hundreds, 100 hectares of uh, fish pond not used, and then uh, 4,000 odd hectares, 2,435 hectares have been released for use. And according to the Secretary, uh, in uh, considering whether a site is suitable for development, they do not just consider whether it is sterile, is um, deserted. They also consider the shape, topography, availability of infrastructure, etc. In fact, when the government has the will, they can always do it. We have uh, over a thousand hectares of land there. We have a uh, keen demand for l housing, and I think. Uh, it is unjustified that the land should be left unused there. So my question for the secretary is, do you have the courage or new thinking to overcome the ecological and environment constraints so that a thousand hectares of land I don't know can be used, for instance, the wetland buffer zones Can, or for uh, those uh, wetland buffer zones already rezoned, can you relax the um, development parameters so that um, the site can be used for providing housing and to uh, serve our economy? Secretary, thank you. Now, uh, we cannot adopt a fragmented approach in land development in NT, we do not just uh, consider individual plots isolatedly. Now, by means of high-density development, we want to uh, provide residential, commercial uh, land use so that although Hong Kong is a small place, we still have a lot of country parks, open space, and also uh, leisure areas. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Wu, Mr. Gordon Wu has um, made a study, has done a study, and uh, he's of the view that we need infrastructure to support development in the NT. Now, near Hang Yun Wai, near Meng Kam To, near Lok Ma Chow Spur Line, we are very um, uh, eagerly pressing ahead uh, with developments that can serve Hong Kong. Now, for the uh, wetland buffer areas, 
Can we really use them for development? The answer is no. It depends on the local circumstances. For buffer areas, we can allow low density development. Whether the buffer areas can have uh, their development parameters relaxed without affecting the ecology, uh, this is uh, being considered. Mr. Kenneth Lau. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the 14th five-year plan was just approved last week, and uh, there should be a more development in the GBA, but I believe uh, the government has not kept in pace with uh, the country's development in uh, planning for uh, more development in the NT. So may I remind the Section once again under GBA and also the 14th five year plan, uh, the area in uh, our boundary crossing points are very important land parcels, and we should reserve, we should earmark land there so that Hong Kong can take part in the GBA development. I've asked her whether the closed area of Shuttlecock can be opened, but the government has consistently said no. Quoting security reasons, I'd like to know whether the government has any intention to do that. Instead, um, it uh, would like to reclaim land at uh, Pillar Point, at Black Point, and I think uh, this is polluting the area. Do you think this is the best way to develop GBA? And uh, we're going to have um, super um, burial areas in Shaling. I'd like to know whether this goes against uh, this goes against uh, the um, development principle of GBA. Let me declare: I am a villager of uh, Lungkutan, and I also have land in the NT. The reason why we have sewage facilities and burial facilities uh, located in northeast NT because we need such a sewage facilities to tie with the new developments in Kutong and NT East in the future. And then these facilities are not unique in the NT. Now, as selling burial ground, uh, there will be a new columbarium and also a crematorium and also a funeral parlor planned. In dealing with these uh, facilities, we have done sufficient assessment in terms of uh, the, the impacts on the environment. Now, for Satao Kok, it is very different from other areas of Hong Kong. Chong, in uh, in Chongying Street, there can be a flow of uh, goods and uh, people without any proper control point. So should Sattelcock be further opened, then all these considerations will have to be dealt with very seriously. And for uh, Black Pillar, our view is that there is potential for further development here. Uh, that is Long Kutan, and we have need for logistics arrangement. Now we are studying the Tumun South link. We'll see whether that can be linked that can link up with the River Trade Terminal, which is uh, underused right now, and perhaps uh, it can uh, be further developed and this will tie with development in Tumun West. Uh, we will start a study very soon and then we will uh, seek further support from the council for that study. Ms. Eunice Yong. In the main reply, the secretary said that a north economic, northern economic belt will be developed, so that there will be land for housing, modern logistics, R and D warehouses, and emerging industries. The site is about one thousand four hundred hectares. Uh, we still have the east and land time metropolis, so. Will there be a North Lantau metropolis here so that we can have a core commercial node here? After all, uh, the future population will be 
uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of people because in Santang, the plant of 84,000 residents and the logistics corridor at Mankom To, uh, the plant population is 200,000, quite substantial. So if the site is just uh, for R and D, I and T and logistics, will that be too, the scope will be too narrow. Can you uh, expand the business opportunities and make a north anti uh, metropolis there, and the site can also be used uh, for uh, tourism and uh, for uh, leisure and recreational uh, purposes. Secretary, as said by Ms. Yong, we will have uh, up to 300,000 people living in the northern part of Lantau with lots of job opportunities, but there is a fundamental difference uh, from Kao Yi Chao because they are two different locations. A large international headquarters, INT Industries may be more suitable for Kao Yi Chao because uh, it's close to central with the road network properly built. The distance is only 10 kilometers and also 10 odd kilometers from international airport. So we don't believe uh, North NT can have a fourth a core business area. But when it comes to INT industries and sectors where there is plenty of uh, cooperation opportunities of Shenzhen, I think this is a feasible area. So we are talk about more than 100,000 of jobs to be provided. And in Hong Sui Chin, Ha Chin, NDA, there will be another 100,000 odd jobs. I hope that by means of such developments, we can address the imbalance between uh, demand and supply of jobs and flats. We don't believe uh, where Satumun can be another core business area, but then uh, it should be suitable for uh, retail and other uh, business activities. Mr. Michael Tian. Uh, regarding a uh, replanning of Lower Station, uh, I just came back from Beijing. I've checked there. Now it was said that Law Wall should be replanned. Uh, so that there can be a uh, collocation of uh, customs and immigration clearance at the um, subway of Shamchan, and that land can be leased to us at a low uh, rate. Now, as we all know, you have to walk a long way. You have uh, to walk past Low Wu Commercial City, and there is no traffic connection. So uh, Low Wu has uh, lost out to Lokma Chao. Spur line station. Now, if the whole area is to be redeveloped, and then just like Song Shui, uh, with a split of 70 30 of public and private housing, there can be plenty of land for housing. So, can we release the land at Law Wolf for construction of public housing? Because we are short of land in Hong Kong. Uh, right now, uh, um, crossing the border. At that location is really not convenient. You have to drag your suitcases along. Yes, uh, apart from Lo Wu, Lo Ma Chao Wong Kong will see some replanning. Lo Ma Chao Wong Kong, uh, uh, now we're discussing co location arrangement there. And we are conducting some very uh, specific studies there. For Lo Wu, the situation is like this. The Transport and Housing Bureau will be the lead bureau. We're aware of uh, the idea from the mainland, and we've started communication with them on this. When we have made substantive progress, we will give an account to the community in due course. Now, if uh, land at Low Wu can be released, the Development Bureau will then start the relevant study. But uh, the development potential is not as um, big as uh, Mr. Michael said. Now, there are only four hectares of land at Law Wu and 20 hectares of land at Law Ma Chao. Uh, bear in mind that there will be a railway there in the future. 
and uh, for residential developments, we have uh, to take into account uh, noise impacts of the railway as well. <coughs> Question five, Mr. Michael, look. From the 23rd to the 24th of January this year, the government set up a restricted area in Jordan arranged for persons within the area to take a test for the COVID-19 and distributed to each of them a food pack which contained four cans of canned food of different types, three of which were cans with easy-to-open coffers. Those persons staying in the guest houses within the area, including journalists, were also distributed food packs. A news report of the radio television Hong Kong RTHK, pointed out that no can opener nor cooking imp implement is provided in the guest house and attached a photo of a food pack in which none of the cans showed the side with a rain pool. Some members of the public have criticized that the photo, by willfully hiding the rain pools of the cans, misled readers into thinking that all the cans could only be opened with a can opener. RTHK issued a statement countering the criticisms as smear accusations, which it severely condemned, and insisting that the news report had stated the facts. However, a newspaper which had published a similar photo subsequently issued a statement in which it stated that the photo concerned had been removed as the photo was misleading, admitted its oversight, and made an apology. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it has requested RTHK to conduct a review and submit a report on the practices adopted in the news report, if so, of the progress of the review, and whether it will submit the report to this council, and two, whether, whether RTHK issued the aforesaid statement after obtaining the approval of the then Director of Broadcasting, if so, whether the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development has requested an explanation from the Director of Broadcasting, if so, of the justifications for giving the approval. If no approval has been obtained, whether RDHK has reviewed if the contents of the statement were appropriate, if it has of the review outcome, if it has not the reasons for that. Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. President, on the 23rd of January this year, Radio Television Hong Kong, RTHK, reported on the setting up of a restricted area in Jordan by the government in response to the epidemic. The news reports mentioned the time of cordoning of arrangements for compulsory testing and the types and quantity of supplies distributed to people inside the, cordon the cordoned area. It was also stated that neither can openers nor cooking utensils were provided in the guest house. A photo attached to the report showed only the bottom of four cans along with other goods, without mentioning whether any such cans were equipped with full open taps. The report has aroused public concern, and there were views that the public would be misled by the news reports into believing that some supplies distributed could not be used. With prior agreements of the then Director of Broadcasting, RDHK issued a statement on the 25th of January that it strongly condemned such smearing views and reiterated that the news report had stated the facts. As at end of February, RTHK received a total of 548 complaints about the report. In response to Mr. Michael Locke's questions, in view of widespread public concern over the report, the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau, CEDB, has sought to gain an understanding from RTHK and requested it to handle the complaints seriously, including a review of the, of the causes of the concern. The possibility of providing readers with more information and a more comprehensive coverage of facts at the time so as to avoid misunderstanding and bias or even queries about the objectivity of the reports by the RDHK. As a public service broadcaster and a government department, RDHK will always be accountable to society. While it is natural that there are different views on its news reports, RTHK should respond to public criticisms in a more positive and proactive manner. 
in order to uphold the highest professional standards of journalism as pledged in the charter of RDHK, RDHK should first look into complaints object objectively and on the basis of facts, make timely clarifications to the public, listen humbly to different views, and try to better itself where there is room for improvement. RTHK should learn from the experience gained in the handling of this case. Over the past half year, CEDB has conducted an in-depth review of and made recommendations on the governance and management of RTHK. A review report was released in February. The review report pointed out that there are major deficiencies in RDHK's mechanisms for editorial management and complaints handling. RDHK will seriously follow up the recommendations of the review report. In the process, RDHK should seek advice from the RDHK Board of Advisors and other stakeholders. CEDB will monitor RDHK's follow-up work. Thank you, President. Mr. Michael Look. Thank you, Chair. Uh, President, the Secretary is trying to put down the matter lightly in his response. However, one point I agree with, that is, the RTHK will handle this matter seriously. We hope RTHK will not become the BBC Global Services, who is very proud of disseminating fake news and uh, working against China. However, the then Director of Broadcasting, Mr. Leung Kao Wing, has condoned such behaviour. Now we have the new Director of Broadcasting, Dr. Patrick, uh, Mr. Patrick Lee. I have high hopes for him. Now, the Secretary said he would deal with the, the issue seriously. So how? Will you carry out an investigation on the reporter to see whether he did that deliberately? He had edited the report in, a, in such a way that it is biased. So is the RTHK still upholding the principle of being impartial and accurate? Secretary, President, I have mentioned how we would deal with the case in my response. I will not repeat. According um, about Mr. Michael Lok's uh, question, uh, we have a high standard for news reports. We often refer to the Charter of Radio Television Hong Kong about accurate and impartial reporting. And also, according to the Charter, the editorial principle must be accurate and fair, especially 3.1. It says um, the RTHK's reporting should be accurate and impartial to reflect the truth and also RTHK has to provide a comprehensive report on facts. That's why the RTHK should uphold the pledges um, under the charter as well as the guideline to deal with uh, reporting imp uh, with impartiality. And also in terms of complaints handling in the governance and management, review report, it is mentioned that the management has to deal with the complaint seriously and respond to the public. What question has not been answered? He hasn't answered me whether he considered this report to be a fair and impartial report. As simple as that. Anything to add, Secretary? President, I have already covered that in my previous reply. Thank you. Mr. Ben Chen. President, in the restricted concerning the restricted area in Jordan's uh, report, it really tarnished RTHK's reputation. The outcome is very serious. In the end, RTHK even issued an announcement to deny its fault. It is so baffling. This report made us question the RTHK's commitment to the Charter. They did not report the truth and they did not uh, follow the guidelines. This is very serious. In the main reply, the government said 548 complaints were received. I understand that an investigation has been carried out, but what about the outcome? 
there were seven complaints substantiated against RTHK, and RTHK was condemned for one of the cases. But so what? With so many, so many complaints, even some substantiated, has the RTHK carried out any measures to punish those who those um, are related to the complaints, or even remove these staff from their original position so that they could not cause additional harm to RTHK's reputation. President, Mr. Ben Chen mentioned two kinds uh, of complaints. One is complaints made to the communications authority. Like other broadcast like other broadcaster, RTHK is subject to the rules laid down by the communications authority uh, for broadcasters as a whole. Mr. Ben Chen mentioned six substantiated complaints of RTHK's shortcomings. RTHK has adopted different measures, for example, pooling the relevant episodes, issuing apologies, and so on. Besides programs, in terms of editorial um, pol uh, policy, as well as uh, program uh, quality, RTHK will carry out reviews as well. And also, besides uh, complaints made to the Communications Authority, there are complaints made to the RTHK. Like other governmental departments, the RTHK has a set of mechanisms to handle these complaints. These are also covered by the Governance and Management of RTHK Review Report. As a governmental department, RTHK has deficiencies in handling complaints. RTHK lags behind other gov governmental departments in its handling of complaints. So RTHK will have to make improvements according to the review reports. And also, like Mr. Ben Chen mentioned, for substantiated complaints with communications authority or with RTHK, if it is found that the reporting is not truthful and if there are um, ethic issues with staff and RTHK, we have to follow it up. What question has not been answered? I was asking about the seven substantiated complaints or if this complaint, complaint, if it is substantiated, will you punish those people responsible? Secretary, President, for substantiated complaints or future complaints, in dealing with these complaints, RTHK will adhere to its own mechanism. It will look into the cause of the complaints as well as the uh, response. If necessary, RTHK will follow up the matter um, in um, human resource management. Mr. Holden Chow, we have seen programs from RTHK violating the charter. So we are asking about the uh, how we can make sure that the charter is adhered to. Are there any suspension? For example, there have been um, prosecutors under the DOJ encouraging people to um, to protest against the national security law. Now the prosecutor has been suspended from work. It has been reported on the media. media. Should we apply the same standard to RTHK as a public service broadcaster? If RTHK staff have violated the charter, should they be suspended from work? Secretary, concerning Mr. Holden Zhao's question, as a governmental department, RTHK is subject to the same standard as other governmental departments. If there are irregularities, um, the staff will be dealt with according to the same standard for civil servants. Ms. Alice Mack, President, in the main reply, the Secretary mentioned that RTHK, as a public service broadcaster and a government department,
it should serve to benefit society. It should be credible in its reports. However, recently the community is very polarized. RTHK often gives us the impression that it is biased and it favors a certain group and targets another. It serves to jeopardize the credibility of its reporting. It is very shameful. In the main reply, the CDB would follow up on the work of RTHK. So what mechanism do you have in monitoring RTHK's follow-up work? How can we rebuild RTHK's image as a fair and impartial broadcaster? How can the CDB monitor the progress? And can you give us a timetable, Secretary? Thank you, um, Ms. Alice Mack. Recently, there have been a lot of complaints against RTHK. Um, some have been substantiated, and there are some very serious cases. For example, the for the six cases uh, handled by the Communications Authority, the natures are very serious. That's why we have spent half a year's time through the work of a task force. We have carried out an in-depth study in terms of the governance and management of RDHK to locate the deficiencies. And we have listed out all these shortcomings. Most importantly, we have to make sure that the RDHK adheres to the charter and be held accountable to the public. There are several issues. First, concerning the governance and human resources management within RTHK. RTHK has to be responsible to the CEDB, which is responsible for um, the policy issues. Secondly, RTHK will be subject to the regulation by the Communications Authority, which will handle uh, the complaints. Thirdly, it is mentioned in the Charter that there is a board of advisors. The board of the board of advisors will not participate directly in its editorial work. However, concerning the editorial principles as well as the quality of its programs, the board of advisors would provide advice. So these are what we are going to do uh, in terms of monitoring RTHK. Mr. Peter Shiel. Thank you, President. Secretary, in the past few years, many members of the public had a lot of concerns about um, the editorial work of RTHK. For example, they targeted the police. I think um, some of these um, programs were very um, outrageous. Now, there are at least uh, seven cases um, about um, shortcomings uh, in, editorial, in the editorial process. So I hope you should provide RTHK with uh, the right direction. Now, um, honestly speaking, uh, not all programs under the RTHK is problematic. For programs which has nothing to do with um, pol politics, um, they are of high quality. Now, some RTHK staff members have been calling me in the past few days because it seems that the entire uh, city is accusing them. They have been assuring me that they would be able to adhere to the charter, and they are worried that if RTHK um, is closed, they will lose their job. Now, I hope um, you can keep RTHK because it is it has um, very good hardware. You just need to... Um, to uh, address the deficiencies. So will the secretary tell me whether you will keep RTHK and whether you and how you will uh, make sure that um, RTHK is up to standard as a public service broadcaster? I thank Mr. Peter Shu for his views. RTHK has its own value. 
as a public service broadcaster in the government's department. If the RTHK can achieve the objective set out in the Charter by itself, then it is very valuable. The situation is RTHK has been doing well, and their programs are well received by the public, and they are very diligent as staff members in RTHK. However, there have indeed been programs uh, causing controversies in the community, and there are even substantiated complaints. Some principles adopted by other broadcasters have been violated. For example, um, untruthful reporting and um, reporting without verification of facts. So it is up to the entire department under the leadership of the Director of Broadcasting as the Chief as the editor-in-chief to lead his team to achieve that. Sometimes it is not about political stances. Every program should be impartial, fair and accurate. They should uphold the highest standard to create quality programs to serve its functions under the Charter as a public service broadcaster, it has to sustain citizenship and civil society as well as promoting knowledge of one country, two systems. And also, according to the Charter, it has to provide a platform so that the public can voice their views without fear and bias. With sufficient Monitoring RTHK can still serves as a very valuable public service broadcaster. Mr. Junius Ho said that he would have Ms. Priscilla Liu ask the question on his behalf. Chairman, since 30th of June last year, Article 7 of the National Security Law for Hong Kong has been implemented and it stipulates that the Hong Kong SAR shall complete as early as possible legislation for safeguarding national security as stipulated in the basic law. So in other words, the Hong Kong SAR should, pursuant to Article 23 of the basic law, enact laws of its own to prohibit acts in endangering national security. The government has also repeatedly indicated that Hong Kong SAR has a constitutional obligation to enact le legislation on Article 23. So in this connection, will the government inform the Council of the latest progress of the work to enact legislation pursuant to Article 23 and 2, whether, according to the government's assessment, the relevant legislative work can be completed within the current term of the Legislative Council? If the assessment outcome is in the affirmative uh, of the, uh, the legislative time, if it is negative, then what are the reasons for that? Ch Chairman? I'd like to respond uh, as follows. Hong Kong SAR is an inalienable part of the People's Republic of Ch China and has the duty to safeguard national security. The uh, Hong Kong SAR has the constitutional responsibility for enacting legislation on Article 23 of the Basic Law to prohibit any act of treason, secession, sedition, subversion against the Central People's Government, or theft of state secrets prohibit foreign political organizations or bodies from conducting political activities in the SAR, to prohibit political organizations or bodies of Hong Kong SAR from establishing ties with foreign political organizations. Article 7 of the Hong Kong National Security Law clearly stipulates that the SAR should complete as early as possible legislation for safeguarding national security as stipulated in the basic law of the Hong Kong SAR and shall refine relevant laws. The SAR government has been carrying out relevant work in respect of, uh, in respect of the enactment of legislation on Basic Law Article 23. Such work includes examining the bill submitted by the Hong Kong government to the Legislative Council in 2003 and conducting legal research. I'd like to point out the following. First, there has been drastic changes in Hong Kong's national security risks since the attempt to enact legislation in 2003. 
This period saw acts and activities uh, such as the illegal Occupy Central in 2014, the Mong Kok Riot in 2016, the establishment of the Hong Kong National Party, which was banned in 2018 for advocating Hong Kong independence, and in particular, there was a spate of violence and riots perpetrated by rioters since Ju June 2019, which lasted for more than 10 months. During the period, rioters wantonly blocked roads, seriously vandalized shops, MTR stations, and other public facilities. They hurled a large number of petrol bombs, set fires, violently stormed and trashed the Legislative Council building, damaged government premises, as well as willfully assaulting people holding different views. Local terrorism started to breed as marked by seizure of large quantities of explosive firearms and bullets. Illegal acts advocating Hong Kong independence were rampant and interference from external forces was severe with shameless individuals colluding with external forces and willingly serve as puppets and foreign proxies begging foreign countries for sanctions against China Scores of saboteurs attempted mutual destruction with the intention of jumping off the cliff with Hong Kong and pushing Hong Kong residents into the abyss. Some even plotted subversion against state power, posing grave threat to national security. The implementation of Hong Kong national security law has delivered immediate results. Hong Kong has emerged from chaos into stability with a significant reduction in violent acts, act activists endanger Hong Kong. National security have either fled or announced their withdrawal. Advocacy of Hong Kong independence has subsided. The community has returned to normal and people's lawful rights are protected. This fully testifies why legislation for safeguarding national security is important and necessary. However, law-abiding awareness among the public has been greatly weakened and advocates of Hong Kong independence have not given up. So we need to remain vigilant. Hence, legislation of basic law, Article 23, has to be enacted and must be done so comprehensively and uh, be able to tackle serious and extreme circumstances which may arise. Secondly, the Hong Kong national security law has stipulated four categories of offenses, namely secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to, endang to endanger national security. Two of the seven categories of offenses or activities stipulated by Basic Law Article 23 that is, secession and subversion against the CPG are already covered by the law. When examining the enactment of legislation on BL23, we have to determine whether it is no longer necessary for Hong Kong SAR to legislate on secession and subversion against the CPG, or we have to review if there are other acts involving these two categories of, ex of offenses which are not prohibited under the Hong Kong National Security Law and would need to be dealt with the legislation on Basic Law 23. At the same time, we have to ensure that the relevant details of legislation must not conflict with the decision of the National People's Congress on establishing and improving legal system and enforcement mechanisms for Hong Kong SAR to safeguard national security and Hong Kong national security law. Since the enactment of the law, the police have arrested 100 persons suspected of having committed offenses. The DOJ is now prosecuting five cases under the national security law, including secession, inciting secession, terrorist activities, collusion with a foreign country or external element, elements to endanger national security, and conspiracy to commit subversion. The court hearings are underway, and the implementation process, in particular court decisions, interpretation of legal provisions, and the application and the procedures and experience of which could provide valuable reference for legislation on BL23. Third, safeguarding national security is the top priority of every country, and different countries have effective laws in place. These relevant laws and experience is worth our reference. We need to in examine the content of relevant laws, measures adopted, and when approaches used. Uh, a lot of work is involved, and the scope is also very complex and should not be underestimated. Fourth, looking back on the experience of legislative proposal on BL23 in 2003, the government had prepared
detailed consultation over a three-month period. There were diverse views. Some people felt the, the provisions were too stringent, and others felt that they should have greater deterrent effect. I believe that there will also be diverse public views, so we need to draw up effective and pragmatic proposals, provisions. We also need to conduct public consultation properly, formulate appropriate publicity, and explain and communicate with members of the public, explaining legislative principles and details. We also have to guard against demonization and malicious spear of BL23 by people with ulterior motives. We've already undertaken various work regarding legislation of, of BL23, and we should not underestimate the complexity. Regarding the legislative timetable, we need to make objective judgment on the legislative work. In light of the work and scope that I described, the considerations and complexity and the requirements under basic law, Hong Kong national security law, the SAR government will complete the legislation of BL23 as early as possible, but it would be difficult to complete in the remaining term of the current Legislative Council. Mrs. Priscilla Leung, I agree that uh, Hong Kong has turned a new chapter after implementing national security law. Now, if we look at the BL23 legislation, I believe that in the second last paragraph, as described by the secretary, there was a, it was a very contentious subject uh, back then. But I think Hong Kong has come to a rational understanding and ideally we should complete our responsibilities and obligations to legislate. If we cannot complete the legislation this year, I'd like to ask the secretary. The NPCSC has a decision to refine our election system and uh, we will have to uh, amend our legis our election procedures or no. So the theft of national s secrets, this has not been uh, legislated. So we have to consider these under our election ordinance, such as candidacy requirements for um, uh, candidates running in the election. So if you cannot complete the work this year, and we might have other relevant legislation on the table, how will you handle this workload? Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Leung said that back in 2003, we tried to legislate BL23, and the controversy might be different today. I understand there might be these views, but I have to point out that in my principal response just now, we cannot underestimate the situation. As I said just now, Hong Kong independence or threats to national security have toned down, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I also said our compliance with law uh, has been weakened and there are threats. I have also said in other circumstances, in other venues, we need to uh, stay vigilant against terrorism and when we discuss BL23 legislation I agree that uh, it's a controversial subject and of course after 2019 after the riots uh, we have become more rational but you can still see that Hong Kong independence this thinking is still prevalent in certain circles and is being promoted so on one hand, we're enacting national security laws. We have to do a better job in governance. We still need to retain, maintain a vigilance and deal with the legislation of BL23. Ms. Lan also mentioned that under the in the election amendment ordinance, are there any elements of national security we need to consider? Now, after examining our existing laws, if what we have to cater to under the election ordinance, 
uh, we they have to uh, candidates need to uphold the BL and also uh, swear allegiance to the SAR and we also emphasize patriots ruling Hong Kong uh, we have to be careful regarding candidates um, qualifications now, our national security laws mention that the police department they have a responsibility so how we make amendments to the election ordinance will depend on NPC decision but I agree with Ms. Leung any of these amendments have to be considered from the perspective of national security but our existing legislation is sufficient to manage risks so operations and uh, the implementation are more important mr jung kok -kwan. some of the content of national security law and Article 23 of the BL, including secession or communication with foreign organizations, and even the details such as application for bail, uh, there is a significant overlap. So how will the government ensure that Article uh, 23 of the BL will not be in conflict with national security law will you adopt the relevant national security laws thank you chairman uh, that hit the nail on the head so whether it is npc or the national security law content any hong kong legislation cannot be uh, in contradiction with our national security law so when we legislate BL 23 we have to ensure that and in my principal response I had mentioned that so will we be quoting our quote legislation from the national security laws that is one consideration but in my response just now There are a few areas I wish to cover. Aside from making reference to our national laws and Hong Kong na national security law, I'd also like to t make reference to other jurisdictions, especially since we have a common law background. We, would, we, would, we need to examine that how we can avoid future interpretations so in my principal response just now I mentioned we would like to make reference to court rulings so we have to look at the interpretation on bail applications so court rulings of course can serve as a reference when we le legislate for BL23 we will ensure that our future legislation when it is presented to LegCo for scrutiny it won't be in conflict with NPC interpretation and our national security law Mr. Vincent Chen thank you chairman I agree with the secretary saying that after national security law has been enacted the social situation has stabilized people feel more relieved but at the same time uh, legislation of BL23 is also our responsibility so I want to understand the national security law requires that we have a dedicated unit to formulate national security policies BL23 its contents need to consider the Hong Kong national security 
a scenario and how we can implement uh, the central government's policies. So could you tell us the BL23 legislation work, how can it reflect our National Security Committee's uh, thoughts? Well, Mr. Cheng referred to the National Security Committee. Uh, now, in our national security legislations, our Clause 14 states it very clearly. And Mr. Cheng is also correct that uh, the National Security Committee in our Clause 14 says that they have to analyze Hong Kong SAR, uh, national security scenario, and also formulate policy related to national security. Now, in Clause 14.2, it also says that our committee uh, will not disclose its work details, so I cannot state directly the, the role of the committee in BL23 legislation. But I stated clearly that when they formulate policy, they have a spearheading role. So that is all I can say on the National Security Committee because uh, anything related to them is confidential. But whether it is National Security Committee or BL23, this is the SAR government's responsibility. We will have a thorough discussion with all the relevant bureau departments and the secretaries. And I will definitely report to the CE so when we formulate these policies, it is not just uh, uh, conducting a legal st division study and hand it to LegCo directly. Within our, the government, there will be f full discussion. We will brainstorm and proceed very cautiously. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Siwakafai. First of all, I have to thank Secretary Lei Gachiu. Uh, in the last year and more since 2019, uh, he has been attacked by the opposition verbally, and he has been upholding the nation's pride, the police's pride. So we're seeing initial results now. And once again, I have to thank Secretary for his efforts. So after enacting of national security law, I heard the Secretary say that it uh, seems that uh, things are calmer now, but I agree with Secretary some people still harbor some confusion and even other thoughts. So BL23 legislation is necessary. But uh, as this legislative year is coming to an end, uh, we won't have enough, we might not have enough time to complete this uh, bill. So what is still missing? Uh, what if we have more publicity? Can we undertake more work so the public understands this legislation? Thank you, Mr. Xu, for your encouragement. I need to say that in 2019, we have to thank the police. Uh, they undertook their duties without fear and they uh, dealt with a multitude of problems. So now we're trying to legislate BL23. I agree that we need to maintain stability in Hong Kong. So aside from police publicity and education, etc., I feel there are still a few more areas where we need to work harder. We need 
to enhance our compliance so well with the law because that was weakened during the riots people the public needs to understand what is prohibited we also need more prevention because the national security law aside from penalties it requires the SAR to prevent any illegal activities so aside from explaining the different communities I, as I responded to questions just now, I have to explain the current scenario. There, it might look calm on the surface, but there are a lot of undercurrents. Some people are still harboring thoughts regarding, uh, they are still harboring dangerous thoughts. So we need to instill positive values. We have to comply with the law and we need to serve the greater public good and and I uh, I'm confident I can continue in this work government bills first reading